well, greetings from, from Macau, the, uh, the second special administrative region of the People's Republic. Um, I'd like to begin by obviously thanking John for his help on getting the, the British edition of China's Great Road, um, getting it ready in record time. It's the quickest book Praxis Press has ever been involved in. And also giving us the chance um, to add in a, a special preface to the, to the British edition. And I'd also like to thank uh, the comrades in New York at 1804 Books for all their technical help, the design, the layout, the formatting of the files and so on. Um, again, that made a huge difference in um, getting the, the British edition into, into print as quickly as, um, as quickly as we did. Um, John's book is very important for a whole number of reasons. I'll, I'll try and stick to the ones which I think are um, the most significant. Uh, the first one is that it's written from the perspective of Marxism. And that reason alone makes it stand out from the overwhelming majority number of, of titles and commentaries that you have on China. And I think that John's approach specifically uh, is one that marries the, the kind of disciplines or sub-disciplines of Marxist political economy and historical materialism. Um, and that gives John's book a number of advantages over any comparable book. The first is that it places uh, the critical role of the state and political agency, um, specifically the Communist Party of China, uh, center stage. And the second, really, I think, very, very significant factor in the book is that unlike 99% of books written about China, uh, including those written by people who would, might regard themselves as Marxists, John actually takes seriously the Communist Party of China as a Communist Party, as a party that's guided by Marxism as a party whose policies and strategies are informed and inspired by Marxism. And that's very unusual. That's a very, very rare category of, of uh, literature as far as China's concerned. Um, I think that allows the book, um, and I think readers will get this straight away, is, that it, is it the ability to see China's development um, not just in terms of its historical and comparative uh, perspectives, um, but also to look at it in a, a theoretical terms, um, principally the question of where we locate China in terms of its own transition process towards socialism. The Communist Party in China uses the term the, the primary stage of, of socialism, and John um, goes into that in some detail quite early on in the book. Uh, there's a, a section there, but it's it's all it's you can find references to the primary stage of socialism all the way through the book, um, and I think that's one of the most uh, important elements of the CPC's strategy. It's understanding, um, and John remarked there earlier about um, the the famous quote from Marx about resting by degrees. This question of um, no no question of an overnight transition to socialism. The, I think the Chinese phrase is the, uh, the rash advance. The periods of the rash advances in Chinese history have usually been quite disastrous. It's the steady build up, the cumulative growth of, uh, of China's economy that is, is what's really the most important. I think also um, taking that into consideration, it's a, a, a reminder really of Marx's famous remark to the effect that human beings make their own history, but they do so in circumstances that are not of their own choosing, that they inherit um, circumstances from, transmitted from the past. Um, because that's ignored by very many uh, self-styled Marxist commentators on, on China's development. Um, Marx, after all, had talked about the transition from capitalism to socialism, but China had a much more complicated background uh, China was a semi-colonial, semi-feudal society um, throughout the first half of the, the, uh, the 20th 
uh, centuries. So by the time of the revolution in 1949, it developed, it, it uh, inherited one of the weakest economic bases in, uh, in the world, as, as John has, has said. So I think that his historical perspective is a very necessary one. I think also um, probably one of the first things I read or studied of John's was uh, one of his early works uh, when he was in Russia and after the collapse of the Soviet Union. And I think that John's experience in witnessing the chaos and collapse of um, Russian society, the Russian economy in the 1990s is a really important um, counterweight to those who argue rather simplistically that, that China too has undergone some kind of capitalist counter-revolution at some point. The divergent experiences of the Russian people and the Chinese people couldn't be, couldn't be more different. I think also John brings into play the importance of the, the weight of China's growth in terms of the global economy. Now, I think this is very, very interesting. It's something I think which we're all very, very aware of. Uh, I think John does a great job in, in just emphasizing just how critical this, this is in terms of the opportunities for, um, for other countries. He mentioned um, Bolivia, Venezuela, and so on. The opportunities that are opening up both uh, economically, diplomatically, um, and I think also ideologically for the left as a result of China's rise by putting an end to this uh, US hegemony, this uh, unipolar world that um, they tried to construct after 1990. This is gonna have a tremendous effect. Um, it's not surprising there's maybe a lot of confusion at the moment among the left internationally. They don't understand China. Uh, it seems to be a very far away experience, um, especially people in the Western left, and I'm, I mean specifically the Northern, uh, North, uh, Northern American and uh, West European left. The experiences of people in Africa and Asia and Latin America are very, very alien to us. And it's only really by immersing yourself in, in other kinds of societies that you begin to, to understand just how uh, phenomenal China's achievement has actually been. Um, I don't want to use up my whole eight minutes. I hope I'm not where, nowhere near using that. But I just wanted to end on one other uh, point, which I think again um, is a really, uh, a really important point about the book. Um, it, it's John has brought together an immense amount of research, uh, statistics, tables, data from a whole variety of sources, and in a period when there is a determined attempt to promote a kind of China skepticism where everything about Chinese statistics or Chinese realities is considered suspect in the West. The idea that China is deceiving the world about its economic growth or its COVID response or its vaccination rates or, or whatever. These are, these are becoming very deeply rooted. So it's very important, I think, that we are able to fight back with uh, powerful empirical um, counter arguments to that. And John's book is a fantastic resource uh, for doing that. And I think also uh, what John does rather brilliantly, I think, is to bring together these very dry statistics and to put them into human terms, to talk about the, the doubling of life expectancy, to talk about the, the drops in uh, infant mortality, the expansion of education and so on. So there's a human dimension to China's uh, development. And I think that's something maybe that uh, the left and the West needs to do a, bit, a little bit more of, rather than simply to talk about China's growth in terms of GDP or, or what have you. It's how this has transformed the lives of 1.4 billion people for the better. Uh, that's the real lesson, I think, of China's great road. Thank you.